Saturday Night Live isn't just about goofy sketches and crazy after-parties. Plenty of cast members disliked each other in the show's first few decades, but who was universally hated by pretty much everyone? Chevy Chase and John Belushi were both tapped for the cast of Saturday Night Live for the show's inaugural season back in 1975, but the two had actually known each other long before that. They had previously appeared together in National Lampoon's off-Broadway Woodstock spoof Lemmings, but that didn't mean that they got along like old friends when they started at SNL. As authors Doug Hill and Jeff Weingrad detailed in their book Saturday Night, a backstage history of Saturday Night Live, the two had a tendency to clash. Chase would jokingly claim that he was responsible for making Belushi palatable to television viewers by teaching him how to use a fork when eating and shaving the hair from his back. Chase and Belushi's rivalry grew even stronger during the first season of SNL, when Chase immediately became the show's breakout star. But as his fame grew, so too did his arrogance. This rankled the rest of the cast, but absolutely infuriated Belushi, who felt that Chase was receiving all the best material and the majority of the screen time. As Belushi put it, I go where I'm kicked. They throw me bones dogs wouldn't chew on. You all right, Jim? Yeah. You comfortable? Yeah. Okay, good. When Chase exited SNL partway through the second season, there were fears that the show would bleed viewers without its star attraction. Belushi, on the other hand, was thrilled to see him go, and eventually went on to become a star in his own right until his untimely death in 1982. After quitting SNL, Chevy Chase became a movie star, which he never let his former co-stars forget when he returned to host. He'd been replaced by Bill Murray, who was predisposed to loathe him, something Chase made easy due to his escalating arrogance. Tensions grew when Murray made a crude joke about Chase's troubled marriage. Chase responded by referencing Murray's pockmarked face, joking that astronaut Neil Armstrong had landed his spacecraft upon it. Five minutes before the live show was about to start, Chase found Murray in John Belushi's dressing room. The two exchanged both verbal and physical blows, with Belushi and Murray's brother Brian stepping in to keep the men apart. Chase later claimed that Belushi had been poisoning Murray against him, telling Howard Stern about a conversation he'd had with SNL creator Lauren Michaels. I found out later from Lauren that John had been quite kind of jealous about my rise to fame. Meanwhile, Murray opened up about the conflict in a 2012 interview with Empire, saying, It was really a Hollywood fight, a don't touch my face kind of thing, so it was kind of a non-event. According to Murray, they later buried the hatchet, and all was fine between them. According to his SNL co-star Jane Curtin, John Belushi regularly declared his belief that women weren't funny. As Curtin said during an interview with The Ringer, John absolutely didn't like being in sketches with women. Lauren Michaels confirmed this, telling the outlet there were two lines that Belushi wouldn't cross, dressing in drag and appearing in a sketch that had been written by a woman. He seemed to be a bit more flexible about the former rule than the latter, though. Curtin also claimed that Belushi made it his mission to sabotage sketches written by women at table reads by giving lackluster performances. As Curtin revealed to Oprah, they were working against John, who said women are just fundamentally not funny. Curtin made another allusion to Belushi's bigoted side while talking to Andy Cohen on Watch What Happens Live. There were a few people that just out and out believed that women should not have been there. Uh huh. Belushi's widow, Judy Belushi Pisano, however, has said that he was misunderstood and blamed his views on his upbringing. She explained, I think John actually was a woman's liver before I was, sometimes contrary to some things you might hear. John was very good with women in general. After the original Not Ready for Primetime players exited the show, Saturday Night Live returned in the fall of 1980 with a new cast and a new producer, Gene Dumanian, taking over for Lorne Michaels. The season was a disaster, and at the center was square-jawed Charles Rocket. Tall, lanky, and handsome, the new Weekend Update anchor was positioned as the next Chevy Chase. But Rocket didn't become the breakout star as had been anticipated. Instead, it was Joe Piscopo and 19-year-old Eddie Murphy who began garnering all the attention. Interviewed for Saturday Night, a backstage history of Saturday Night Live, Piscopo recalled the arrogance of some members of the cast, who assumed the show would propel them to instant stardom despite the awful material they were producing. Apparently, that was particularly true of Rocket. Murphy and Piscopo consciously dissociated themselves from the rest of the cast, with their sketches standing out by being far funnier. When Rocket later complained about Piscopo's weekend update bit getting more laughs than he did, a shouting match erupted. Rocket yelled, You're not part of this cast at all. 
To which Piscopo responded, You're one-dimensional. Rocket followed that up by threatening to rip out Piscopo's throat. Not long after that, Rocket was fired after dropping an F-bomb during a sketch. Norm MacDonald was reportedly no fan of his co-star Chris Kattan when the two were members of the Saturday Night Live cast. MacDonald said of Kattan in a 1997 interview with Rolling Stone, I don't find him funny. What can I say? Never made me laugh. An anonymous insider told the New York Observer there was indeed bad blood between the two comedians. The source told the outlet, They had a very acrimonious relationship. Norm would rip Catan to his face. Norm's a weird guy. If he doesn't like someone, he'll say it to his face. Johnny! <laughs> oh no, that's not good. Will Ferrell recalled one instance of conflict when Catan and McDonald were taking a flight together. Catan took off his shoes and took a nap, and when he awoke, his shoes were gone. Catan accused McDonald of stealing them, but he insisted he hadn't. Farrell recalled on the Fly on the Wall podcast, An entire season goes by, and then Catan and Norm are jousting back and forth, and then Norm finally goes, Oh yeah, one other thing. I did take your shoes. I threw them in the trash can. In 2015, long after both comedians had left the show, Catan insisted in a tweet that their feud was make-believe. He wrote, Norm MacDonald is one of the funniest guys I know, and our SNL feud was only for comedic purposes and was never anything other than satiric. Janine Garofalo got off to a rocky start after joining the cast of Saturday Night Live in 1994. According to a now infamous piece for New York Magazine, she'd previously trashed the show in interviews, claiming that SNL had become unwatchable and singling out Adam Sandler's comedy as childish. Garofalo's co-stars did not take kindly to her critiques, as she admitted that her experience on the show had been akin to hazing at a fraternity. A friend of hers said she was miserable and depressed, revealing, She's absolutely destroyed as a person. The show has beaten the shit out of her. The article noted that Adam Sandler refused to speak with Garofalo, but eventually broke his silence toward her just to tell her off. Sandler wasn't the only person on the show who disliked Garofalo. When she hesitated while trying to remember a line, because of her insistence on learning her lines instead of just reading off cue cards, which is the show's norm, producer Al Franken exploded. Someone who'd witnessed the incident recalled, Al went house. Read the cue cards. Despite all of the hostility, Garofalo insisted that her time on the show had been a learning experience that sharpened her as a comedian. Nevertheless, she wound up quitting the show a few months before the end of the season. When Tracy Morgan joined the cast of Saturday Night Live in 1996, he wasn't greeted warmly by two other members of the cast. In his memoir, I Am the New Black, Morgan went off on Chris Kattan and Sherry O'Terry, claiming that both treated him disrespectfully when he arrived. He wrote, All I have to say about that is, where's Chris Kattan now? Where's Sherry O'Terry now? That can't even get arrested. Morgan added even more fuel to the fire while recording the audiobook version. Gawker was the first to report that he went off script and added a few choice comments about the pair saying that they would never come back to host the show like he had. That didn't mean that Morgan's SNL experience was totally toxic, though. He continued, There were people that treated me beautifully, like Will Ferrell and Colin Quinn and Molly Shannon. I love them. But Sherry O'Terry and Chris Kattan? I never cared for them either. F*** them. During his tenure with Saturday Night Live, Tracy Morgan also took issue with fellow SNL member Jimmy Fallon's chronic laughter. In an interview with Penthouse, Morgan admitted that he really disliked Fallon's habit of cracking up during sketches and breaking character. He didn't appreciate that it detracted from sketches that took effort to write, saying, That's taking all the attention off of everybody else and putting it on you like, Oh, look at me, I'm the cute one. Morgan gave Fallon a stern warning, which he apparently heeded. Morgan recalled, I told him not to do that in my sketches, so he never did. Morgan fired further shots at Fallon during his time as Tracy Jordan on 30 Rock with the help of his fellow SNL alum Tina Fey. Several episodes feature Tracy purposefully derailing sketches in Fallon-esque fashion, while several others feature Fallon himself as a punchline. You a celebrity? I have my own show on NBC. No, celebrity. Morgan has since appeared many times on Fallon's Tonight Show, so it's reasonably safe to assume that this particular hatchet has long been buried. Future movie star Will Ferrell teamed up with Chris Kattan for a series of popular Saturday Night Live sketches, playing two guys in a nightclub who dance their butts off to Hathaway's What is Love. Those characters were fleshed out to become the Butabi brothers in the big-screen spin-off A Night at the Roxbury. 
In his memoir, Baby Don't Hurt Me, Catan claimed that Lorne Michaels, who was producing the film, encouraged him to hook up with director Amy Heckerling, who Michaels feared was looking to exit the project. Catan called Farrell several times but never received a response. When they finally returned for the 23rd season of SNL, Catan asked what was up, with Farrell revealing he'd found out about the secret relationship and felt betrayed. Catan claimed Farrell told him, So, I got all your messages, but I didn't call you back because I didn't want to talk to you. I don't want to be your friend anymore. Heckerling's daughter Molly issued a since-deleted tweet confirming that her mother and Catan had a brief affair, but that it happened well after production was underway. Heckerling herself dismissed all of Catan's claims, telling the Daily Beast, He's a nut. I don't even want to know or hear the dumb sh he came up with. Nora Dunn had a tendency to clash with other members of the SNL cast during her time on the show, but particularly with John Lovitz. As she revealed in a 2015 interview with Salon, I think we were a dysfunctional family. He and I had a love-hate relationship. According to Dunn, her background in theater didn't gel with Lovitz's more chaotic approach, which often led him to disrupt her attempts to rehearse. She further recalled, So I would get very irritated with John, and we'd have arguments. Dunn, of course, is remembered for her well-publicized decision to boycott an episode hosted by controversial comic Andrew Dice Clay due to criticisms that his material was homophobic and sexist. Lovitz shared his recollection of that incident in an episode of the ABCs of SNL podcast, saying, Anyway, it's the second to last episode of the season, and Nora caused a lot of trouble and she was very hard to get along with, so SNL wasn't going to ask her back anyway. Lovitz argued that Dunn's principled stance was just a publicity stunt that left the rest of the cast feeling betrayed because she made them look bad for not joining her boycott. Lovitz continued, Anyway, the next week was our last show, and Nora was back, and everyone was like, they just wouldn't speak to her. Victoria Jackson spent six seasons in the Saturday Night Live cast, known for her high-pitched voice, ukulele-fueled songs, and gymnastic handstands. Speaking with Salon, Nora Dunn admitted that she didn't get along with Jackson at all, saying, I couldn't work with her because we weren't on the same page. Ever. We weren't even in the same book. We happened to be on the same show. Jackson, however, remembers Dunn and their fellow cast member Jan Hooks ostracizing her. As she asserted on the Wasn't That Special podcast, her and Nora were very mean to me for the whole time we were there. Let me ask you, that, that dumb thing you do on that show, is that just an act? As far as I know. <laughs> okay. Jackson claimed that the women were jealous because she was landing movie roles and they were not. However, it was Jackson's religious fervor that really wound up irking the other members of the cast. Feeling that it was her duty to share her beliefs with her co-stars, Jackson regularly proselytized to them throughout her tenure. One Christmas, she gave her co-stars audiobook versions of the Bible that were not well received and returned to her. When producer and performer Al Franken confronted her, she responded, Maybe I'm overcompensating because everybody here is dying and going to hell, and I'm supposed to tell them about Jesus. She added, He never talked to me again.